okay? So there wasn't much known. So something happened in 1962. Uh, Mike Warren uh, organized a meeting at Penn State, and this is where the pioneer, Brenda, opened the door, in my view, to the future of our understanding of frontal lobes in humans. This is Brenda in 1962. This is Mike Warren, uh, who was my PhD advisor. This was Harry Harlow, who did those first um, dorsolateral prefrontal lesions in monkeys, who he also was Mike's um, supervisor, Mort Mishkin and Lucas Teuber. I mentioned them because they became um, really monumental figures as well in our understanding of frontal lobe function. So why did this meeting occur? All of these very stern looking chaps, mostly not women obviously, uh, came from uh, Europe. A lot of Eastern Europeans were studying the effects of frontal lesions in cats, monkeys, and dogs, and humans. Okay, and the idea was to try and get some sense of what the frontal lobe was doing across species. Now, the volume that came from this meeting, most of you have never read, you've probably never even seen it or heard of it, but it turns out to be really important in my view. And for me, it was a, it was a Bible as a graduate student. The um, chapters, the papers that were in there were largely on non-humans, but there were four on humans. And the most important one was by Brennan. In fact, both Mike and I, I think, concluded later that it was the best chapter in the book and the most influential chapter in the entire book. It's entitled Some Effects of Frontal Lobectomy in Man. Now we have to make a little distraction here, and that is uh, David Grant was a colleague of Harlow's, was interested in Harlow's studies of reversal learning, and so he invented the Wisconsin card sorting test as an analog in humans. Now all of you know this test, I know, but I'm just going to mention it very briefly. You're, you're presented with four cards that vary in color, number, and shape, and you're given a deck of cards, and you've got to match them to where you think they go. So if you had this one, you could put it here, and it would be on um, green, and it would be also a number too. Or you could put it here, it would be shape. As you're doing the study, you do card after card after card, and the uh, experimenter tells you whether you're right or wrong. And if you've got 10 in a row correct, unexpectedly, he or she changes the category. So if it was color, it's now uh, shape. Okay, you don't know that, you've got to figure that out. So that's what the task is. And it just keeps going like that. So Brenda got the test from uh, David Grant and she gave it to her patients uh, that she was studying at the MNI. And on this particular paper, what she's got is dorsolateral frontal patients and the controls, which are uh, orbital frontal patients, temporal patients, combined patients or posterior cortical uh, lesions. You can see the number of categories, the number of times that the patients could shift um, was more than one, uh, but the um, dorsolateral frontals could um, preoperatively do it, although not as well as the controls, but there was no significant difference. But postoperative, they couldn't do it at all. On average, they could do 1.4 categories, which means they stuck on color most of the time and could not shift to another strategy in contrast to the other patient groups. They made a lot of errors, both preoperatively, don't forget they have frontal pathology, that's why they're having surgery but post it was even worse compared to these groups, okay? So what did Brenda conclude? Well, the first conclusion really, although she didn't express it this way, was that we now have a test of dorsolateral uh, frontal function, um, a sharp contrast between the patients and the control subjects was obvious. In addition, the performance of the patients with lesions in the orbital frontal cortex uh, was different than the performance of the patients with dorsolateral prefrontal lesions. In other words, the two regions of the frontal lobe are doing different things. This was a really novel observation. And at this time, at the meeting, if you read the, the book, people were trying to find something that was a unitary function. What is it that the frontal lobe does? It does more than one thing. Uh, Brenda published a subsequent paper, in which she just focused on card sorting. And naturally, it has more citations than the book chapter, they always do. Um, and as of today, February 14th, uh, 2021, it's been cited 2,840 times. It's had a huge impact. One of the things that you notice when you study patients with left frontal lesions is they're very quiet. They don't have much to say. And the question is, why? Is it a problem in verbal fluency? <coughs> Pardon me. Or they just don't remember any words. 
So Brenda gave the Thurston word fluency test, which is a test in which you are asked to write down as many words as you can think of, starting with some letters such as S, and you're given some fixed time, such as five minutes. And you can see the mean, the IQ was normal, as we've already determined, but the patients with left frontal lesions were, had a, a, roughly half as many um, words as the patients with lesions elsewhere. In contrast, on a test of verbal memory, where a score of 20 would be good, the frontal lobe patients were normal and the temporal lobe patients were impaired. So the problem is not one of them not remembering words, it's the problem of them not being fluent. So what Brenda concluded was that the left and right frontal lobes are dissociated. Now this really wasn't known except for damage to uh, Broca's area, obviously with the phasia. But outside of Broca's area, no one had suspected this. And the left and um, temporal and left frontal lobes can be dissociated. Now, another test that she gave um, was a test of maze learning. And in this test, you have this board that has these uh, metal heads on it, and you're given a stylus, and you've got to try and guess what the route is to get from the start to the finish. And the rules are, you can only go this direction or this direction, no diagonals. If you are correct, nothing happens. If you're wrong, uh, an error counter goes, <clears throat> and you've got to back up to wherever you were and start again, okay? We can see here, if we just look at the errors, that the patients with right temporal and right frontal lesions are severely impaired. The problem is, and I think Brenda's right here, she couldn't see how that shed much light on frontal lobe function. But one thing that did was the behavior of the patients in the test. That is, they broke the rules. They didn't comply with the test instructions. So in a subsequent study published in 1965, what she simply did was count the number of times they broke rules. They made diagonal moves, they didn't return to the uh, start after an error, and they skipped steps and so on. You can see a huge effect. Okay, so what conclusions can we reach from those initial studies in 1962? Well, we've already seen the IQ is normal, but the patients have a clear and previously unsuspected cognitive deficit. Head was wrong. Now, Brenda used to, to sort of kid around saying that uh, she was a bit miffed that Hebb didn't really believe that what she discovered was that the frontal lobes were involved in cognition. Well, I think she's over that now because obviously she was right. Um, the effects of dorsal lateral PFC and orbital frontal lesions can be dissociated. The effects of left and right frontal lesions can be dissociated. Patients with frontal lesions do not follow rules. Now, this isn't just true of maze learning, it's true in life in general. It's a huge cognitive effect. And she was able to show that by studying the MNI population, it was possible to conduct studies that could be compared to those in laboratory animals with focal lesions. Now, this is not a trivial thing because it means that tests of um, in monkeys or cats or rats or whoever uh, with prefrontal lesions can be designed after testing humans and vice versa. And, um, I've done both and it's been really a wonderful thing to be able to do. So what did this pioneering, pioneering, pioneering work uh, lead, lead to with Brenda and her troops? Well, lots of things. I've just got a few examples here. Um, studies uh, with many colleagues looking at language functions beyond Broca's area. Um, fMRI studies, for example. Uh, face and limb motor control, working memory, recency memory, spontaneity of behavior, very type, various types, temporal ordering, the temporal organization of behavior, I say Mr. Brackett, associative learning, social cognition, and more. Now, what's important here is that this does not include work that all of us did based on Brenda's studies after we left her lab, nor does it uh, include work done by others based upon her studies. Look at that number of citations for the card sorting it's used everywhere. Um, I want to give you a couple of examples because I think they're useful. One is recency memory, studies done by Phil Corsi and Brenda in the early 70s. So here's the task. You're given a series of cards, so let's say A or Tanner or whatever, one after the other that has a picture on it or a word on it, depending on whether it's the word or, or non-word version. And then all of a sudden you're given a card that's got two on it. In this case, these two, and you're asked, have you seen these before? Well, the frontal patients knew they'd seen them before. 
Which one did you see most recently? They don't know. It's a recency uh, memory problem. In contrast, temporal lobe patients can't recall having seen them before, but they can guess which one they saw most recently. Okay, so you have a double dissociation here. Here's the temporal artery task, task of Michael Petridis. So you're given, um, th this version has eight pictures on a card and you have to point to one. So let's say you point to the window. Then you're given a new card with the eight pictures, but now they're in a different location. And what you've got to do is point to a different one. So patients with dorsal outer frontal lesions are impaired temporal artery and they can't remember um, which ones they pointed to. It's also obviously a recency memory uh, problem as well and associative learning. So what you do here is there are six identical cards here and you've got to learn when this light goes on, point to the, this card. When this light goes on, point to this card. Okay, so it's an associative learning, it's nonsense. We, we have all these associations all the time. Why are red and green lights important? Well, because we've learned this association. The frontal lobe is playing a key role in this, okay? So although Brenda, is well, uh, most well known for her work on the temporal lobes and memory. Uh, her impact on her understanding of the nature of the frontal lobe function has been equally monumental, in my opinion. As a frontal lobe chauvinist, naturally I'm more interested in frontal lobe than temporal lobe, but I think I can stick with it, my, my claim that it really has been important. She's published, as far as I could figure out, 25 papers on frontal lobe function. These have been cited nearly 10 or 12,000 times, which would be an average of 463 citations per paper, which is an enormous number, of course. Now, not all patients, sorry, not all papers had that many citations, but most of them have hundreds of citations, 200, 300 citations. So this had a huge impact. She's given countless talks. I remember one all over the world. I remember one um, that I was at a Society for Neuroscience in 1975, and there was a lot of people there, one or 2,000, I would guess. Uh, and it was on what the human frontal lobes do. Um, one of the things that um, I found remarkable is when the talk was over and I was leaving the auditorium, I was listening to comments people were making. Now, I realized that most people in those days who were at SFN meetings were not studying the human brain. Um, they were studying non-human brains. They were flabbergasted. I'm returning to her chapter to end here. There were three other chapters in this book on the human frontal lobe. One by uh, Lucas Torber, one by Andre McCann, one by Ralph Ray Tan. All of which argued that we'd made little progress at that point in understanding the riddle of frontal lobe function. That's Torber's words. Well, these three chapters are long forgotten, but Brenda's has been a beacon for studies to follow over the next 50 years. Now this, the chapter in there, as I mentioned earlier, was not especially highly cited because chapters never are. But the papers that followed from her and all of her uh, colleagues clearly has been a pioneer in understanding of the frontal lobe. Thank you.